How's it going? Garrett with CSI. This winter we're going to take you through the build of a brand new quarter midget from frame all the way till we hit the racetrack. So let's get started. So our cars came to us uh, not powder coated. And so the first thing we're going to do is get all the body panels off <clears throat> and, and do any customization we have to do to the body panels. I'll talk about that a little bit and then uh, get all of the Zeus springs off to get the frame ready to uh, head off to powder coat. When we put all this back on, we'll get rid of all these heavy steel Zeus buttons and go with aluminum. We'll go really in depth and show you everything we do to our cars. Um, a lot of the little tricks that you might not know. So now that we have all the body panels off, we'll start a pile for powder coat and then a pile for anodize. So we want to powder coat anything that's going to be a, a, a body work, um, something that's higher wear that, that needs to last longer, something like, um, your fuel tank rods will anodize these um, and it kind of the anodized part is is um, some of them are for wear and performance and some of them is just for looks like what you want your car to look like so you don't necessarily need to anodize the rear axle um, I like to do kind of my whole assembly black if the car is going to be black just so it all looks nice and uniformed all the spacers black but we'll go th through that in a little more detail when we open um, some of our packages, but the last thing we need to do to get the chassis ready for powder coat is to get rid of these zoo springs. So why go through the effort of drilling out a couple hundred pop rivets? Um, just because it looks way nicer when these aren't powder coated. If you leave these on and get them powder coated, one, the Zeus buttons don't want to go over them um, because of the thickness of the powder coat. And then two, it wears all the powder coat off where the Zeus button goes, so it just doesn't look good. So we take all these off, um, and then I have the front and rear bumper just tapped in but taped on. It's not drilled just because it was easier to move around. So obviously we'll take the front bumper and rear bumper off before it goes to powder coat. So just with an eighth inch drill bit, um, we'll drill out every one of these, which isn't super hard, but So that's one gone, and now we got to do a bunch more. <laughs> Before you can pop these back on, you got to get all those little pieces out because you can't pop them that way. So we'll show you the easiest way to do that too. <laughs> one of the bigger pain in the necks when you're drilling all these out is you end up with all the heads of all the rivets on your drill bit. So a little trick, just grab it with a pair of pliers and run it in reverse and it'll walk them all off. Now you're ready to drill a couple hundred more. So one of the challenges is when you get your car back, you're going to have to pop all these back on and you can't pop them back on with the rivets in there. If you're really lazy, you could throw them all away and spend a couple hundred bucks buying new zoo springs. But um, really, if you use a pair of side cuts, typically you can push them out, get them out. Every now and again, you get one that's really difficult, but you just pull that pop rivet out. I've seen guys um, try to drill them out, and I've seen guys that can do it really well. I can't because it's just really hard to hold it there you go so shouldn't have took that long once you do a couple of them you get in the rhythm but so now that we have the car ready to go to powder coat we're going to open the box of goodies uh, that came with the car to sort out what needs to go to anodize what needs to go to powder coat and what can just stay here in the race shop Ooh, la la so these are all of the pieces that it's going to take us to build this machine. Now for anodize, pretty much any of the stuff that's aluminum will get anodized black. Um, it looks nicer, holds up better. 
But in order to do that, we need to get rid of anything that's steel because you can't anodize steel. So on this birdcage half, we're going to have to take out this stud because it can't anodize it with that stud. So that could go in the anodized pile. Uh, what I like to do, <coughs> excuse me, is take an inventory of what we have, make sure everything's here. And so when we send stuff to anodize, we send them with a list. We make sure we get all of our stuff back. Um, but we're going to send all these radius rods off to get anodized. The birdcage pieces, micron bracket, um, the steering mount. But we'll have to take that spherical bearing out because it's steel. So we'll take that out. Motor plate, um, but we'll have to take the bolts out. These will go in our powder coat pile. So the spindle steering arm combo, they'll get powder coated along with the front axle and the steering shaft. All of the axle spacers, um, axle nuts and keepers, fuel cap and uh, rear hubs, those will all go in our anodized pile. So we'll get a pile for anodized, a pile for powder coat. Again, anything that's gonna get anodized, we gotta take the steel out. And then um, on some of the powder coat stuff, you'll wanna tell whoever's powder coating it, like that spherical bearing, you know, if they just powder coat it, it'll get all gobbled up where the steering shaft goes through. So we'll mask that off for them and tell them when we drop it off to be careful to not blast that. So we just got our frames back from the powder coater. Uh, Corey Eliasson knocked these out, beautiful gloss black for us. So kind of the first step when they come back is to get the Zeus springs back on um, all the Zeus plates. We'll do that and then we will jump into the next couple steps and prepping the chassis to uh, be assembled. You can do it with a hand pop rivet gun, as many of these as we have to do. This Milwaukee battery powered or an air one make life super easy. When you're doing this, you just want to make sure you're putting pressure on the Zeus spring so it's nice and tight. Otherwise, if you aren't holding it up there tight and you pop the rivets, it'll wiggle around a little bit, you know. So now that we have all of the Zeus springs popped on, um, there's a couple more steps we're going to have to do to get the chassis ready to assemble. The first one we're going to show you is um, cleaning out all the bumper spuds. So when they get powder coated, um, powder coat gets in there, makes it really hard to get your uh, bumpers and nerf bars in. And we don't like to have to pound those in with a hammer. So a uh, little drum sander on a Dremel works great or an air one if you have it. And just simply going to go in there and clean it out. So once we've cleaned all of the bumper spuds out to make it easy to get the nerf bars and bumpers in and out, the next thing we're going to do is drill out um, all of the holes that we'll be utilizing when we're racing um, because they get, they get, the holes get closed up a little bit with the powder coat. So you don't want to be at the track and you need to lower your pan hard a hole and the bolt won't go in. So we're just going to drill all those now. Um, so that'll be the front pan hard holes. I don't use the standard brake pedal and gas pedal, as you'll see later in the build. But if you did, you would want to drill out your pedal holes um, and your pan hard holes and anything that you're going to have to utilize a hole that's been slightly closed up due to the powder coat. So we'll start back here on the back. So you can see how the powder coats filled the holes and the bolt does not want to go in. At some point throughout the season, we're going to use every one of those holes. So we're just going to drill them out. And again, you're gonna to wanna to do that for anything that you're gonna run a bolt through on the car. After it's been powder coated, um, the bolt won't fit in there. So the last step in prepping the chassis to be assembled um, is going to be to run a tap through any of the threaded spuds on the chassis. Um, most powder coaters who do a lot of race cars, they know to plug these off. So I don't imagine there being a lot uh, in here, but it's still good just to run the tap through there to make sure you're not gonna have any issues. All of these things 
just speed up the process of assembly if you take a little time initially. So the next thing we're going to do is put the floor pan in and as we go through the build process we're doing everything in certain steps just to make it easier um, and so we'll go from kind of the bottom up with the floor pan and then the front back. So um, when we go to do the floor pan when I pop the Zeus springs on we use steel pop rivets there. Yeah, I use aluminum everywhere else just to keep the car as light as possible. Um, but same thing, I use aluminum Zeus buttons everywhere, except for on the floor pan, we'll use steel. Reason being, if you got a driver as small as Hudson is, um, you're gonna end up with 40, 50, 60 pounds of lead on this floor pan and um, aluminum pop rivets and aluminum Zeus buttons uh, aren't recommended to hold that much weight. So now we're to the point that we're going to assemble all of our radius rods. So when we put the front and rear end together, we have all these rods um, ready to go on the car. So I've separated my right hand and left hand uh, rod ends. For me, the easiest way to sort the rod ends is <clears throat> um, the right hand is in my right and the left's in my left. But on the right hand threads, the threads will point downhill to the left. And then on the left handed, the threads will point downhill to the right. So it's opposite um, left hand thread threads are going downhill to the right, right hand thread, threads are going downhill to the left. And then I like to use a COPPA slip. Um, some people use anti-seize. And what I'll do is I'll just run a little bead. I like it in a syringe, it's a little more controlled. So just run a little bead on your um, broad ends. And when you're doing this, make sure that you have the jam nut threaded all the way down. Um, because we're going to want to screw these all the way in to um, assure that as we adjust, that it's even. You don't, you don't ever want a radius rod that one side's sticking out farther than the other. So um, obviously the left hand rod ends go on the knurled side. The right hand would go on the non-knurled side. And so when we're done, we want it like that. Well, it'll be like that. Um, because if you had it, if you started the build like this with your right side sticking out farther, then as you adjust, if you have to lengthen this rod end, which you probably will, you'll end up with way too much sticking out over here. So both of them threaded all the way in and that's one rod complete. And now we have to do a dozen or so more. So the next step in our build is to uh, build our front axle. And so kind of have all the parts laid out. And the first thing I do is take and drill out all the holes to get the powder coat out. We'd mentioned that in a previous step, but we're gonna do that to the front axle as well. And then also uh, tap for the front pan hard. Um, just run a tap through there to clean out the powder coat. And then again, where the set screws are. So pretty straightforward. Um, so after we've tapped, uh, for the set screws for your camber adjustment and for your front pan hard and drilled um, all the spots that your radius rod and your left front shock will go through. Uh, the next thing is just to make sure that your shoulder bolt fits nicely um, through your spindle. So you want a nice smooth fit. If it's not perfect, if powder coat got in there or just the bushings are a little tight, um, you can run a ream down through there and get it nice. You don't want it sloppy. It'll get sloppy over time. Um, it's a maintenance item, but to start out fresh, you just want a nice smooth fit. After we've got everything fit, we're just gonna bolt our uh, spindle steering arm combos to the front axle, and then we'll take it over to the car and put it in. So the next step is actually gonna be bolting this front axle in the car. Uh, most people would use just a bolt to affix the radius rods from the chassis to the axle. Um, I like to use studs. 
It just speeds things up in the event of an accident, just taking one nut off, not fiddling with trying to line a bolt back up with the threads, etc. So uh, I'm gonna go around and put the studs in um, up here in the front where the front axle is gonna get attached. And then uh, we'll hook up our radius rods and then we'll take you to the next step, which will be um, connecting the steering shaft to the front axle. So we're using jet nuts, which is an aircraft locking nut, just a personal preference. Um, and then the first time we go to tighten these, we're going to hold the stud with an Allen wrench just because the Loctite hasn't set yet. So we do this before the Loctite sets, that way we can adjust the length of that, right? Like that's perfect. You just want a half a thread or so sticking out don't need any more than that so once that Loctite sets you can just zip these on and off with an impact that stud won't move so that's the right side we'll go around to the left So we use these high collar washers in between the axle flange and the rod end and what that does is it keeps the spherical bearing inside that rod end from binding up. So if you bolt that straight, um, you're not going to get enough movement uh, as the axle goes through its range of motion. So it's very important to have that little high collar washer in there. So now we've got the front axle sitting in the car. Um, everything is kind of loosely assembled at this point because we won't uh, tighten up the jam nuts or set our uh, axle left to right or anything like that until we're ready to go on the table and do our first setup. So we're just kind of getting everything roughed in and um, the next thing we're going to do is put the steering shaft on and uh, get that connected to the front axle. Uh, so as I'm prepping the steering shaft to go in, again I'm going to run stud, studs rather than bolts. Um, all of this is in an effort for when something gets bent and you're in the hot shoot with three laps to get your car fixed, you're not trying to thread a uh, bolt into that and cross threading it right just get the bent rod off slide the new one on put a nut on super simple So we're gonna get this set again red lock tidying them. So once they're in there, they're in there I'm um, not coming out unless you use a little heat uh, another cool thing on a Sherman Steering shaft is he tacks that spacer on for you um, Some of the other manufacturers you have to slide that spacer on and in a hurry swapping front axles You can lose that spacer. So that guy's already tacked on there So as we're putting the steering shaft in, um, it's kind of a two-person job to bolt it into the front axle. Um, so we're going to prepare uh, the quick-release steering knuckle um, and put a steering wheel on it so one guy can kind of hold the steering wheel while you're tightening it. Uh, very important when you go to put the knuckle on, depending on what brand of chassis you have, this particular uses a snap ring to keep that knuckle from sliding down too far and uh, and then this is also directional if you put it on the wrong way your steering wheel won't lock on right so your steering wheel will go on but can pull off so make sure this goes on the correct way so uh, some manufacturers the steering shaft will be threaded for a bolt this particular um, steering shaft from Sherman is threaded so we're going to put a nut on it the nut actually comes from Joe's with the quick release kit um, already turned down um, so the steering quick release hub can fit over it onto the spline so rather than a wrench we're actually going to use these flat Nipex pliers to tighten it because you can't really get a wrench on there because it's been turned down so I'm just holding the steering shaft as I do this and I'm just gonna get it down to where we're uh, through the nylock and tight. There you go. 
So now we're ready to connect the steering shaft to the front axle. We've taken the top radius rod on the right front loose so we can um, basically maneuver the front axle forward to back because it's kind of what you have to do to line it up. If the front axle is hooked on both rods, it makes it very difficult to do. And we have, it's a two-person job, so as we're going to hammer this on uh, with an impact, because if that bolt falls out, the kid's going to go into the corner and the steering shaft's coming out of the axle and he can't turn it. So we're going to hammer that on with an impact, and we'll have somebody hold the steering wheel while we do that. So we're going to hook our right front uh, top rod back on and then uh, we'll get our tie rods on there and roughly get the toe set. Again, all the final settings will be done on the table, but then once those are done, um, we'll start to move backwards in the car. Uh, if you had your shocks and springs ready, they could go on at this point. Of course, shocks will be the last thing to go on this car because we got customer stuff to do. Again, we just have everything roughed in at this point. However, um, as we're trying to roughly get our toe set, it's very important that the timing of the ears on our steering shaft are correct. And you basically want the center, if you drew a line down the center, to be straight. So you don't want to get your toe set and your steering uh, shaft is like that or like that, right? We want it straight. So that uh, as we're setting our toe, we want to make sure that we're, we're close. And again, we're just ru eyeballing, roughing it in, trying to get it uh, pretty close here. Then once that's kind of roughed in, we're not tightening any of the jam nuts. We'll do all the final setup on the table. Same thing with the steering shaft. So most kids are fairly particular how they want the steering wheel. And so if once the toe's set, um, that's as close as you can get it to center. And if you took the quick release off and moved it, then it's gonna probably be over there. Um, all you have to do is take that nut back off and re-clock the quick release spline, uh, quick release knuckle one spline over. So the splines are much finer on the steering shaft than they are on the quick release knuckle. So uh, if you can't get the top spoke perfectly centered when the wheels are straight, uh, the way to do it is by moving the aluminum knuckle uh, one spline left or right. So on the newer style Sherman cars, he's got a right rear bracket to shorten up your right rear radius rods. Um, again, rather than running the bolt this way and kind of fighting with it, if you're moving your pickups up and down, we run a bolt through the backside. Um, this is a setting I don't change very much. Um, so I got those set where I normally run them and we'll get this bolted on the car and then we'll move to getting the rear rods on and getting the rear axle on the car. I have a couple options where we're going to mount our fuel tank, whether you want it uh, center or off to the left. Um, I typically always mount mine um, down and to the left. It seems like uh, with a lighter driver, um, left side ballast is a, a bit of a struggle. So uh, we're going to mount ours to the left. <clears throat> and um, so we'll get this all tightened up and uh, go to the next step. So anywhere we are putting something together that's not gonna come apart uh, on a regular basis and doesn't have some form of locking nut, um, we're just gonna put a little bit of red Loctite. A little bit of this stuff goes a long way and it's like more expensive than gold. So just a little bit of red Loctite. We don't want these rods that are holding the fuel tank on to ever fall off. So a little red Loctite for assembly. So we mount our Micron um, in, the, in the engine compartment. It's a little cleaner, kind of keeps it uh, up out of the air. Um, we've had good luck mounting them down here. Even the Micron 5 that uh, runs off GPS, we haven't really had an issue um, with them here. We run the lap timer uh, beacon as well. Um, 
because when you go race indoors, you don't pick up times from GPS. So we're kind of just mocking this up right now because we're going to work on the wiring. And I like to hardwire my Micron into the switch um, to pick up RPM. That way, when I'm taking my engines in and out, I don't have to fool with it being wrapped around the spark plug wire. So we'll show you how to do that. You can hardwire it right into that switch and uh, it reads RPMs just fine. So this is a self grounding switch. Um, it has a piece of aluminum uh, on here that then goes to the ground side of the switch. So we don't need to run an extra ground wire, which is really nice. Um, however, you gotta make sure where this goes through the chassis that it's really cleaned out and it's bare metal so it gets a really good ground. So we'll clean that up with the Dremel um, to bare metal and then bolt this switch into the car then start to run our wires. I really recommend a nice um, high-end connector, right? The cheap ones you get at the hard hardware store uh, through vibration, um, they can break. So just get a nice connector, um, spend the extra dollar and it won't give you grief. I'm putting heat shrink down on here because after I crimp all of my wires, um, I like to uh, cover them in heat shrink um, just to help protect it, keep moisture out. And then we're gonna run a sleeve over it to protect it from chafing on the firewall or anything else on the car. You wanna make sure that your switch is oriented the same in every car so the kid knows, you know, downs on ups off however you want to do it uh, all of our cars um, we do it where he flips the switch up so um, <clears throat> if you get it reversed it's pretty easy to fix you can just flip the switch 180 but uh, the other thing we'll do once we're done and we have um, everything wrapped in casing and tie wrapped up we'll put a little dab of clear silicone on there that'll prevent that screw from ever backing out with vibration because that's not a locking screw I'm just going to use a little tape to kind of tape it in place to ensure I get the right length as I go through. We'll go back and tie wrap it. I just don't want to waste a bunch of tie wraps at this stage. We'll run it a little extra long out here, but that'll give us plenty of room to, to work here. So if you uh, strip the wire, the RPM lead from your Micron, you can wire it straight into your switch and then you'll get RPM the same as if you wrapped around your spark plug, but you don't have to hassle with moving it every time you take your engine in out. So we're just gonna twist these wires together and then put them in one connector together. Just like that, we'll crimp it and then finish up all of our heat shrinking and have a completed wiring system. So you can use your tire titan for more than uh, scraping tires. We're going to use it to shrink this heat shrink. So now the reason that we shrink all this stuff, keep moisture from getting in there, we have a nice uh, abrasion resistant covering over the wire. So nowhere are we going to worry about it um, chafing raw and potentially causing a grounding issue. Um, again, when we affix this back to the switch, we'll put a dab of silicone, clear silicone on there to keep that screw from coming off. And we'll tie wrap this up really nice and neat so it's not in the way of the chain or the belt. And um, you'll never have an issue with, with your wiring harness if you take the time to do it nicely like this. So another thing that I like to run on my cars is a steering shaft pad. Um, not a lot of things a kid can get hurt on in these cars, but banging their knees on a steel steering shaft um, doesn't feel very good. So this little bit of padding is really nice. Uh, got this from Hanning Race Components, real clean uh, steering pad that we'll run on our stuff. All right, so at this point we got the driver in the car and we're gonna get the steering wheel adjusted uh, up and down to where his arms are comfortable and he can see. And then we're gonna position our pedals where his legs are most comfortable. Um, I really like these Nervo rookie pedals, they call them because not only can you position the pedal anywhere you want front to back, which you could do with the rails that come standard in the car, but you can move the pedals left to right. And so when Hudson was really little, for his legs to be way out here 
at the pedal locations um, was quite a bit. So we're able to get the pedals in closer for him and then adjust them where he wants. All right, buddy, now pay attention here. Lift this foot up. Do you think right there for your gas pedal is okay or do you want it farther this way? A little bit, like like that? Yeah. Now, push on the gas pedal. I'm gonna hold it down. Can you get full pedal there? Can you get, let off, push it. That fine, right there? Yeah. Okay. Now, push it. That's fine, right there, now let off. Okay, so right there's fine for that one. And then this one, a little bit farther ahead, like right there. Right there? Mm -hmm. Because you want to, um, remember, we don't want to rest your foot on that, so we want to be in a position where you can do that, right? Mm -hmm. Is that fine right there? Yeah. I feel like your gas pedal is maybe a little too far forward. I feel like your gas pedal should be maybe like right there. Yeah, that's, that's fine? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead and hop out. Now at this point we'll get some measurements from the edge of the chassis over to where we want the pedals um, and then I'll just look at what hole this uh, pedal is going to line up and we'll get these marked, drilled, mounted and uh, then the pedals will be in place. So the next step in our build is going to be to assemble the rear axle. Um, the Sherman cars use a splined rear axle, so I've already loosely slid the um, brake rotor and brake hub on and the gear hub. Leave those loose for the moment because um, we won't know exactly where those need to be till we kind of get them positioned in the car. Um, then <clears throat> we've already uh, built up our bird cages with uh, CSI factory team bearings, greased them um, with uh, the mixture of triflow and lithium grease that we've talked about before in other videos. Um, and we got our studs and everything on those so it'll be easier just to put together. So we kind of pre-did that. So we're just gonna slide this stuff on. Kind of already had it all laid out. Um, when we go to put the nut on, we like to use um, a generous portion of copper slip just to keep the aluminum nut from galling on the aluminum threads. So again, on the right side, we've kind of pre uh, put everything on there. So now with everything kind of loosely positioned, uh, we'll take it to the car. At this point, we don't tighten it uh, just because we're going to slide this stuff back off when we get to the squaring process. So we just kind of want everything snug so we can uh, button everything up. So let's take it over to the race car. So now we're going to hook uh, everything up here in the rear end. We've already hung the left rear and right rear radius rods uh, off the chassis so it's easy to hook up. And we've actually already bled the brakes as well. That was kind of a two-person job, so I had to do it. Uh, when we had our helper here, um, so the brakes are already bled. Uh, when we do bleed the brakes, um, we'll try to bleed it the line first. So have the line cracked, fill the reservoir, get fluid to the line, then tighten that up, and then bleed the inner bleed screw, then the outer bleed screw, and then we go back through the other way. Um, not cracking the line again, but then outer, inner, just to make sure we get all of the air out. So uh, once the rear end's in, the first thing we're going to do is uh, hook up the rear pan hard um, just to keep it from going left to right. We'll get it where we want it. Uh, Sherman car has three pickups. Um, I'm just going to set it in the middle for now. The way these particular bird cages are, I've found it best to run a high collar washer on the inside and outside to keep the spherical bearing from being bound up. So that's why there's double washers. So you can see that it's very free. Um, with just one, it just had the rod on a bit of a funny angle. So that's, that's why we do double washers there. The uh, left rear rod's hooked up, same fashion, but we don't use the double washers on the left rear. The left rear rods are really straight, so don't have that same issue you have on the right rear. And 
And the next thing we're gonna do is hook up that uh, brake that we had pre-bled. Now that the rear axle is in it, um, we're going to grab our engine, set the engine in it, and um, work on doing the throttle cable and hooking up the fuel line and showing you kind of how we set up our engine compartment. So now that we have the engine in the car, first thing we're always going to do is hook up um, the connector to our kill switch. Um, as we'd mentioned when we showed the wiring part, we've wired the Micron all into it. We have our Micron in the engine compartment. I just like it down there. I think it's a little bit cleaner. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is put the fuel tank on and hook the fuel lines to it, put the exhaust on, and then show you how to uh, route the throttle cable. So on the Sherman car, the fuel tank uh, hose clamps to these posts. When we put these posts on the chassis, uh, we used a little bit of red Loctite because you certainly don't ever want the fuel tank to fall off. And those posts aren't really something you take out very often. Uh, another thing we do to the fuel tank is we put heat shrink over the hose or uh, the, over the hose clamp. And what that does uh, one, it gives it a nice cleaner look, but two, um, now you have a layer of protection between that hose clamp just digging in and chafing on the aluminum tank. I always uh, anodize my tanks in the past, but with the new rules regulations, um, can't anodize your tanks anymore, so that's why it's bare. Um, also, you'll notice uh, I run this setup with an eighth pipe to uh, dash four T's, and the reason I do is once we're once we are hooked up here, um, this is a, a nice, clean way to run your fuel line. Um, some people run a fuel filter in here. I don't. I just filter the fuel when I put it in. Um, but when you have to go drain your fuel, it's really easy. You can just shut the fuel off. I have another line with a 90 pre-built that runs down to my fuel can, and I can just turn the fuel on and drain the fuel that way because you pretty much have to drain your fuel every race day um, at the big races. So that's why the fuel is uh, the way it is. So next thing we'll do is tighten this up and then throw the exhaust on it. So we uh, hooked the spring to get the exhaust pipe hooked to the engine. We're not going to worry about hooking it to the Nerf bar as well. <clears throat> Obviously on a Honda engine you don't have to, but on the animals you'll hook it to the uh, Nerf bar. We're not going to worry about that until we get um, the belt or chain set up on and that way we know exactly where the engine is going to be front to back. You don't want to tighten that uh, engine to the uh, nerf bar and then have to move your engine forward and back and get it in a bind. So on our cars we've always ran a belt drive setup. Um, had really good luck with it. Very little failure rate compared to chains. So we're just going to get the uh, axle gear on here and try to line up the axle gear to the engine gear. One thing I like about the belt drive is the belt is substantially, excuse me, the pulley is substantially wider than the belt. So as the car goes through its range of travel, the belt can move left to right, not get in a bind like a chain does. Um, so we keep that in mind when we're setting this left to right that this left rear is going to come up in the race. So now I got this on here and I don't like how far back the engine is. Um, I had a 776 built on it, just guessing what length I would need. Um, I should know, but uh, you're just always a little bit of a guess with engine and uh, axle gear combination. So I'm just gonna zip off the pan hard and these two left rear rods and get a little bit longer belt to get the engine farther forward. Um, I know where we're going to race 
turning is paramount. And so the more nose weight I can get, the better. This is the heaviest piece um, of ballast in the car. And I don't want to get it too far back, um, too close to this rear axle and struggle to turn. So again, we're kind of just roughing all this stuff in until we get it to the pad and get it square. Because right now, I don't know if the left rear is forward or back, right, until I square it. Um, so we're just kind of getting everything roughed in. Once we do the scale, um, square it, scale it, then we'll go back and tighten everything, bolt check everything um, before we run. But I knew that other belt was going to be way too short, so we'll just leave it there. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is uh, hook up our throttle cable. So we have our housing through. We're just going to stick it in the carburetor boot and pull it through to about, if you pull it, if you get it at too much an angle, if you have it like that, guarantee you the throttle will hang. So we try to give it a little bit of room. You obviously don't want this thing to hit the exhaust pipe. That's, that's about the amount of loop um, I would typically run right like that. I know the throttle's not gonna hang there, um, but yet it's not so high you can't get the tail cone on. So now we're gonna go up to the front and cut it to length um, into our pedals and then run the cable. So now we're going to um, kind of hold it along the route that it's gonna run right up here to where the cable is. Double check that I don't have it too tight back here. Make sure I haven't pulled nothing out too tight back there. And then mark it with your fingers and cut it. One of my, this is a special Garrett tip. Number one pet peeve when building a race car. Number one without question is people who just use janky old side cuts like these to cut their tie wraps. Flush cuts. You don't need to be going to the hospital because you slit your wrist on a sharp tie wrap. So you can see when I routed all the wiring, all of this, they're all flush, right? You can run your finger across it. It's not going to cut you. Flush cuts. Every major tool company sells them. So that's pro tip. So with the animal and the slide carburetor, a little bit different process than with a Honda. But... Stick your finger down in there to get this out. So um, what I will do is run that cable through here, put your spring on all the way down. Come on, Mr. Spring. Bang into the camera. Camera doesn't cost much. Then we're going to be very careful not to ding up the end of that slide, but it's sitting on carpet. We're going to run this guy through here. We want to make sure uh, on these rookie pedals we use, it's actually really nice. The, uh, they have a built-in clamp. We're also going to add another couple clamps. Uh, when I do that, I'll tell you why. So now we want to hook this up. This slide, little slit in the slide, is going to go right here, and you'll feel it fall down in. If you put it in the other way, it will go in, but you will have a hung throttle. So always double check that. I'll push that back down in. Hold that. And the threads are so fine on these things. You want to make sure that you don't cross thread it. You'll know if you have it cross threaded because when you go to tighten it, it won't actually get tight. It'll get tight and then break free. So we know that's good right there. So as I mentioned, I use two of these little locking nuts. Reason being, one time. So you want to make sure that 
when you tighten this first one, give it a little bit, I want to give it a little bit of room, just so there's a an eighth of an inch or so, a dead play. Um, that way, if you push it back too far, you can potentially have the throttle hung. So you can see I have um, just a little bit before it actually hit, is going to hit that. All right? And the reason I run two is I've had before where a kid's wide open and hits somebody and their foot just pushes that pedal super hard and it stretches that throttle cable clamp and now it won't get full throttle. Obviously, you're not going to win a race if you're not getting full throttle. So, so as I work the throttle back and forth a little bit, that's, that's more free play than I want. So I'm going to slide those back just a touch. And I get these suckers tight. Once I know where they're supposed to be, tight. Because like I say the last thing you want is your throttle cable to slip. That's a little better. Okay. I just put these things just to touch. Just so the Allens don't fall out. Like I say, unless you're using uh, one of these Nervo pedals, you won't have that uh, option. But now we got all this excess. I've seen guys twirl it up. I just cut it short. That way we're not dealing with any issues. And the key to cutting throttle cables, like a nice uh, cable cutter. Um, we'll just cut these things nice and nice and neat. So I've cut it way back here before and then when you give it throttle it wants to get bound up here so typically I just cut it right past that angle. And we'll double check that it's getting full throttle and then that is done. So the best way to check if it's getting full throttle is just put your finger in the carburetor, let off a little bit just to make sure the slide's all the way up out of there. It's getting full throttle, no problem. All right, so kind of the last thing on the engine is to hook up um, our breather, our valve cover breather. Um, we got these nice uh, new breather cans from Hanning Race Components, real nice clean billet piece. Um, so we're just gonna simply hook it up um, here not a big fan of the brass fittings. It makes me feel like I'm working on a tractor, but I've talked to uh, Jeff Letter about it and there's a method behind his madness. So we have these beautiful gold brass pieces. They kind of match the gold paint scheme we got going, so. With any push on fitting, you wanna make sure you get it all the way on. And I left a little bit of slack there. So as we move the motor forward and back, uh, we don't run into an issue with this if we're potentially changing gears you don't want to go to change your gear and this is so taut that you can't uh you can't do that so that kind of buttons up the engine compartment um, now we are going to bolt some shocks on this thing put the cage net on it and be ready to go on the table all right so we're going to bolt the shocks on the car now um, again everything's kind of loose, just roughed in ride height wise and all that till we get on the table. But uh, another tip is when you're bolting these on, always put the clip on the outside. And the reason is if for whatever reason that clip comes out or something crazy happens, the shock can never pop off the mono ball. If you put it the other way, the actual shock could pop off. The spherical bearing could still be bolted and the shock can be dangling off obviously resulting in a DNF. So always make sure that clip is out facing you. And I can tell already that the car needs to go back just by the angle of the shock. So no big deal. When we go to square everything and set our wheelbase, um, we'll address that. But we can tell that the wheelbase is probably a little too short by the angle of this shock. So we'll go around, bolt them all on, and then do our roof net.
but I just want to show you um, the proper way to loop through the belts. Another thing is you don't always have to put the belts where the manufacturer has cut out. These kids are different sizes. Hudson's fairly little. Um, you know, he just turned seven. So um, you can see uh, the cutout that Sherman has where most normal kids would hook their left side belt. And I made my own cutout to put Hudson's down here. Um, we've had some good videos with Dave Sharpley talking about safety stuff and how to properly mount your belts. But if I put my belt here, um, the seat belt angle where it hooked was really high. So you couldn't actually pull him tight in the car where with it down here, it's slightly below his shoulder and goes over his shoulder and you can pull him down tight. So that's important where you put um, the belts. So when you go to loop this, um, you're gonna wanna go through, just fish it through as you would assume, right? And some people will leave it like this, but you wanna go back through on your seat belts. So you'll just run this guy back through. Again, pull it tight. So now there's no way that that sucker's moving, okay? Then we'll cut these. Once we do a final measurement, we'll cut them with a very sharp pair of scissors. Um, I typically leave two and a half, three inches, just so if the kid grows, you don't trash a set of seat belts, but you don't want all this hanging around. I've seen people kind of tie it all up and that's just kind of not real clean and, and a waste. Um, the kid's never going to grow this much. So, you know, cut it about here, wrap it around, tape it. After you cut it with a sharp pair of scissors, go back and burn that with a lighter. Um, that way the seat belt doesn't unravel. So burn that edge with a lighter and we'll show that when we do the roof net here. All right. So we got our brand new uh, roof net here from Ultra Shield. Thank uh, Darren and Mandy Pittman for getting us uh, beautiful roof nets and seat belts. Really high quality stuff made made right in Texas and um, proud to, to use it on Hudson's car. So what we're going to do is just loop these things through kind of loosely and you will see that I'm leaving uh, this kind of looped up because that's how I'm going to pull it. So right now it's a bit of a mess, like spaghetti strings. But once we get it close, um, it won't be as big of a mess anymore. They have these head nets in a bunch of different colors to match your paint scheme, which is really cool. Nobody else who's done these head nets has had them in anything but one color. So obviously we went with black to match uh, Hudson's paint scheme here. So we're just, like I say, getting it kind of all loosely up and then we'll measure to make sure it's centered. And I'll show you how I pull them tight, keep it tight. So now we got it kind of on here, but it's not centered. It's way far this way, really far forward. So with our little loops, we're just going to pull, pull it back where we need it to go to try to get it centered. And I'll just measure here. Let me come back a fair bit. And this is one of those things you just want to take your time, get it right. Work your way around the car until you get it positioned right. But as we're pulling, the reason I have these out is I'm pulling, I'm getting this tight, right? Um, you want to get it as tight as you can. And the main reason I run these and I wouldn't let my kid race a quarter midget without one is these cars are extremely safe with the poured seat inserts and the headrests they are very safe. The biggest fear as a parent is a kid gets in an accident and that thing lays on its side and you have this big giant opening 
and a front bumper come in and hit them in the helmet. So this will prevent that. Obviously, the tighter you get it, the more it's going to prevent it. So we're just going to go around and try to get this thing tight. All right, so we got it pretty centered, and it's, you can tell it's taunt, right? So we're just going to give it a, another little pull in every direction. Make sure we have it as tight as possible. So unlike the seat belts, it's like next to impossible to loop these things back through a double, um, but I don't feel like that's super necessary on these, so we're just gonna pull them taut. Sometimes after you do that, you notice one side could be a little tighter, so. Just pull it back out, tighten it, now we're good. And you can do it however you prefer. I leave these a little bit long um, just because for whatever reason Hudson thinks this is a chair and he'll sit on this and they can tend to sag a little over the season and uh, so it's, if you have a, the more you leave the easier it is to get it tight again. So what I do is I just cut it um, flush with this first strap all the way around. And then um, as I do that, um, we'll go back and burn the edge and we'll tape it. So I just cut it flush with that first strap. Again, you need a very sharp pair of scissors because you don't want this stuff fraying. So now that we've cut them all, we're going to go back with a lighter, <clears throat> just singe the edge so this doesn't unravel, and then tape them down nice, uh, nice and tidy. And uh, now you got a safe roof to your quarter midget. For somebody that would be watching us that is building their first quarter midget, I guess what advice would you give them before getting to this point? Is there anything that they could do to make your job and the turnaround time, everything like flow smoother? Yeah, um, well, as far as design goes, if they have something in mind that they already like, you know, a certain style of design, spiky or curved spikes or whatever, then I can kind of take that and then create something in that same realm. And then as far as installation goes, I mean, just to speed things up, anything like Nerf bars, things that protrude out of the car, um, headers or engines. Axles aren't ever too bad because they're generally low and out of the way, but uh, just kind of having things clear to get to, to wrap and install, because as you can see, it's, you have to go around and through uh, bolts and yeah. parts of the chassis that stick out. How long does it take you typically to like, from he tells you the colors to a finished product? I would probably say close to eight to ten hours i mean there's a couple hours maybe in the design process and any revisions um, depending on how many cars you do production on one car could be anywhere from two hours to four if you've got overlays and things like that to cut and place also and then um, obviously installations two or three hours on a quarter midget um, generally a, a full wrap on a quarter midget just for the material would be around 300 um, we've got everything kind of a la carte just because every car is different every uh, the, the sponsors that they have you know the quantity of those are different so um, really if we have a set price then the customer loses out if you know uh, we don't have as many decals and then if there's just tons of decals and overlays and things like that then obviously we're printing more material so I don't really like the package pricing and that goes for sprint cars and everything um, those especially as big as they are you know you can really do partial graphics versus full wraps and change the price around a lot so gotcha. um, so when Garrett's car is done how much is he gonna be in Rough, like. um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I would say these are probably with this. Yeah, they're probably going to be around four to five hundred a car. I'd say around five hundred. Uh, okay. Just because I haven't figured up, I was waiting until we finished production yesterday on all the fluorescent to know the sizes of that and how much. So. Gotcha. So um, different colors cost more and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've got like fluorescent. Pretty much all the overlays and things that we can't print are just priced based on the square footage. But then on those, you got metallics, chromes, the gold leafs, and 
um, to get some chromes, for example, you know, you've either got to go get a really expensive wrap vinyl or find a way to create it with like a transparent overlay over regular chrome. So, I mean, there's, there's thousands of options for uh, coming up with certain schemes and concepts and things like that once you bring it to life. So that completes our build. Thank you guys for watching. We have a great video on squaring and scaling the car, so be sure to check that out. If you have any questions about the build, the parts we used, or a certain uh, way we did something, always feel free to shoot us an email, garrett at csishocks.com, or uh, you can give us a call at the shop, 317-858-8775. We're gonna get this thing on the table, square it up, scale it, and head to the racetrack.